Hello all and welcome back from lunch. I am Cindy Lund and I am one of the co-editors in chief of the Animal Law Review. And to kick off our afternoon, we have Dr. Lori Gruen. Dr. Gruen is the William Griffin Professor of Philosophy at Wesleyan University. She is also a professor of feminist, gender, and sexuality studies, science and society, and a coordinator of Wesleyan Animal Studies. She is the author and editor of 15 books, including Entangled Empathy, which was published in 2015, Crit Critical Terms of Animal Studies, which was published in 2018, Animal Ladies, which was also published in 2018, Ethics and Animals, an Introduction, which second edition came out this year. Uh, there's also Carceral Logics, which came out this year, or is coming out spring of this year, um, and Animal Crisis, which is also spring of this year. Dr. Lauren was a Lawrence S. Rockefeller Visiting Professor of Distinguished Teaching at Princeton University's Center for Human Values in 2018, and a faculty fellow at Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine Center for Animals and Public Policy from 2015 to 2018. She is a fellow of the prestigious Hastings Center for Bioethics and the inaugural inaugural recipient of the Brooks Institute for Animal Law and Policies Scholars Research Fellowship. Sorry, clearly words are hard after lunch. Um, <laughs> Dr. Gruen's work lies at the intersection of ethical and political theory and practice with a particular focus on issues that impact those often overlooked in traditional ethical investigations. This includes women, people of color, incarcerated people, and non-human animals. She is currently working on topics that inform carceral logics, drawing on the black intellectual tradition, as well as legal scholarship and social theory. She's thinking through a complex set of issues like dignity, self-respect, empathy, disposability, and hope and hopelessness. Dr. Gruen has been involved in animal issues as a writer, teacher, and activist for over 30 years. Her relationships with scholars thinking about animals, activists working to protect animals, and perhaps most importantly, with many different animals uniquely inform her, her perspective on how we need to rethink our engagement with other animals. In addition to her extensive publications, she has become known as a bit of an activist, archivist, sorry, for chimpanzees in the US, given her work documenting the history of the first 100 chimpanzees in research in the US and the join journey to sanctuary of the remaining chimpanzees in research labs. In addition to her work in animal ethics, she is actively involved in prison education. She was taught at Bayview, she has taught at Bayview Correctional Facility, a women's prison in Chelsea, New York, which is now closed, the Federal Corrections Institute in Danbury, Connecticut, when it was a women's prison and the Cheshire Correctional Institution in Cheshire, Connecticut, a maximum security prison, and York Correctional Institution, a women's prison. She was also the first chair and founder of the Faculty Advisor Committee for the Center for Prison Education at Wesleyan. And now I will let Dr. Gruen take over. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, I will be talking about a bit of that. I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Um, and see how this goes. Sometimes it's a bit of a um, interesting uh, experience doing this. And um, I'm hoping at this point you see the screen. Um, and one second, it just decided to go ahead. Um, and uh, that's not exactly what we had planned, unfortunately. Okay. Um, let me go. Let me try this. Hey, Lori, it looks good on this end, just to let you know. Right. Thanks so much. The problem is I'm not seeing my notes, so that's the problem. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can try that again. Um, sorry, this is always a little bit of a technical. Uh, concern. So let me try this. Um, 
All right. Well, we'll just we'll just wing it um, if we can. Um, that should be okay, I think. Um, you see the screen, so that should be fine. Yes. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be here to talk about animal ethics, animal law, um, and social justice. And part of what I'm going to do today is um, draw on my book, Entangled Empathy, um, but I'm not going to be specifically attending to that. Um, rather, I want to talk a bit about the ways in which traditional animal ethics and traditional mechanisms um, and methods or strategies in animal law may not be the perfect way of um, persevering um, when we're thinking about questions of social justice. What I'll start by doing is talking about those standard methods um, that I do think shows that we've made good progress, particularly in highlighting the ways in which animal suffering um, is happening both in the United States and across the globe. Um, that's been tremendously important over the last 40 years um, or almost 50 years now um, of animal ethics and also a very important concern in animal law. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the progress we've made, but then I'll turn to talking about some of my concerns about whether or not the strategies that are centrally important in animal ethics and becoming more and more centrally important in animal law are actually going to allow us to get to, um, to um, where we need to be. Okay, next slide. How does, why is it? Um, can you tell, can somebody tell me what screen you're seeing? You're seeing your PowerPoints. Do you, but what, not in presentation mode. Do you see animal ethics and animal law? Uh, I do not. Got it. So that's what's happening. Um, now, now do you we see? Do. Yes. That's okay. So that was the problem. So let's move to talking that. Thank you. Um, talking about human exceptionalism um, and the ways in which the movement has been tremendously successful um, in resisting human exceptionalism. Human exceptionalism is the view that only humans matter morally. It's the view that structures all of the work that we're doing um, in our educational systems, in our legal systems. It's really just focused on humans. And what traditional animal ethics um, has done over the last, as I said, almost 50 years, has tried to expand, expand the sphere to resist human exceptionalism and inc include other animals um, within um, the sphere of moral concern. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, I wanna also say that within animal law, there is a similar strategy of expanding um, our concern beyond just the human to extend personhood to include other animals. And both of these frameworks focus on similarities. So if we think about it in the moral sphere and we think about who matters morally, I matter morally. Well, you matter morally. All of us matter individually, morally. We matter because we can say that this is something important to us. Fortunately, over the centuries, we've moved beyond this kind of narcissistic self-importance to include our families, maybe our tribes, maybe just our race. Thankfully, we've moved beyond that. And for a large part of our current history, we've focused on our nation, but with what's going on in, in Ukraine and what's happened around the globe, we see that we do actually care as human beings about not just our little parochial interests, but interests in global um, human concerns. So we've generally, over the last many, many centuries, gone from being very parochial to concern for all members of our species, or at least an attempt to be concerned with all members of our species. And that extension from 
you know, our narrow interests to their larger interests, the global interests, is absolutely progress. It's absolutely progress. But of course, we've ended up stopping at our species for most, most of um, most people have stopped at our species. It's it's been um, heartbreaking to see um, the animals, um, the non-human animals in the Ukraine um, who are also um, being um, displaced by this horrible war that's happening. And so I think that there is a growing awareness that it's not just concern for our own um, species. And certainly one of the very important things that animal ethics has been pushing on is that boundary here, this idea that boundary around the species that we want to extend um, beyond um, the, our species to include all beings who could suffer. And that extensionism is a very important um, project of animal ethics. It has been a very important project of animal ethics. It focuses primarily on sameness, the idea that other animals are the same as us, or they're the same in certain respects. This is my friend, Emma. You might think she's using tools. Um, actually, it's not clear. She, she's mimicking um, at the time. She's no longer at this facility. She now lives um, at a sanctuary in Louisiana called Chimp Haven. Um, but at this time, she had just watched a repairman fix the hydraulic system with that wrench. So she was going to go ahead and fix the hydraulic system um, with the wrench as well. Maybe she knew what she was doing, or maybe she was just mimicking him. But one of the ideas is that animals are able to use tools. Maybe Emma wasn't doing that in this picture. Um, we know that from Jane Goodall um, back in the day, just like humans initially were de decided that we were the ones that used tools and that's what made us distinct. That's what made that line around our species to exclude all other animals. Um, we, now, we now actually know that other animals make tools too. As, you, as I said, Jane Goodall was looking at um, termite fishing. Um, and at the time it was a shock. This was, you know, again, uh, many decades ago, and it was quite a shock um, because it was thought that only humans use tools. Um, and one of the thoughts was that maybe we have to redefine what it means to be human. That's what many uh, people said at the time. We also know from uh, another primatologist who studies chimpanzees, Savannah chimpanzees, Jill Preetz, that um, chimpanzees make spears. We know from a number of researchers that New Caledonian crows and other birds make all sorts of tools and hooks um, to get at food sources. Animals manipulate their environments in a variety of ways. Maybe it wouldn't quite be at the level of tool use, um, but we see that they build remarkable shelters, sometimes often beautiful shelters like bowerbirds do. Um, they may even have a sense of style. They also solve problems, both physical and social. Um, one of the uh, um, remarkable and humorous examples of a social sol problem solving in vervet monkeys comes from uh, Cheney and Saforth, who observed uh, a young male um, vervet monkey um, flirting with and trying to have sex with a young female vervet monkey, um, which really, really angered the family of the of the young female. Um, and vervet monkeys have different kinds of alarm calls. So if there's a predator in the air, a vervet monkey will um, call out in a particular way and the uh, rest of the group will hide under things. So the, the aerial predator can't see them. If there is, so say a hawk, um, if there's a ground predator like a jaguar, um, they will climb trees. Um, and if there is a predator in the tree, they'll also make an, a different alarm call. So they make at least three different alarm calls. In the case of this young uh, male vervet monkey, um, the family of the female um, was so angry, they started chasing him away um, and they almost were upon him. And according to uh, Safe Arthur and Taney, um, he made an alarm call at that moment which caused them all to head into a tree. So he escaped. I thought that was such a great example of ways in which um, animals can be both sneaky and deceptive, but also use that 
that uh, awareness to solve social problems. We also know that um, some animals use symbols and can recognize symbols, parrots, sea lions, dolphins. There's also animals that have used and understand human language. I mean, there's some question about whether our companion animals do understand human language. I think they do. Um, uh, but there's much more uh, significant and interesting studies of sign language and symbol language um, and touch screen language that um, other animals have engaged in. And we know too that they're emotional beings. There's this beautiful story um, that Barbara King tells of Mr. G and Jelly Bean, who were, uh, Mr. G was a goat or is a goat and Jelly Bean is a burrow. And during a, a terrible situation, they were separate, they were living together in a somewhat like a, a hoarding situation. They were um, not being cared for. So they were brought to sanctuary, but they were brought to two different sanctuaries. And Mr. G, the goat was so depressed and everything they did at the sanctuary couldn't revive him until they realized, hmm, maybe we should go get Jelly Bean. So they brought Jelly Bean, the burrow to Mr. G and his whole uh, demeanor changed and he became extraordinarily happy. Um, and the two of them are quite, uh, are living quite well together now again. Um, and the idea here is really that you can see that they are attached to one another, um, that they have emotions of a variety of sorts. And in that sense, they're quite like us. They also many respond to injustice and betrayal. I hope some of you have seen uh, the remarkable capuchin monkey um, experiments that Franz de Waal and his colleagues conducted um, in which uh, one capuchin is in one enclosure and another capuchin is in another enclosure. And to trade a token, the one capuchin monkey gets a grape, which is a high value food item. And the other capuchin monkey ends up with a cucumber, which is fine, but not a grape. And the monkey takes the cucumber and throws it back at the researcher um, in disgust and shakes on the cage um, because he was apparently outraged by this injustice. Um, so animals are like us in many morally salient ways. Uh, they feel things, their lives can go better and worse for them, and their relationships matter to them. And in this way, we're extending our concern for um, other animals out from um, the center, the, and we see that insofar as other humans have these capacities, we can understand um, that they belong in our sphere of moral concern, so too uh, do other animals who have these capacities. And this leads to, this is a little bit of a dated chart, but this leads to various researchers trying to figure out what it is that matters and who, which capacities um, link up with which animals. So are they sentient? Do they feel pleasure and pain? Humans, yes. Worst case mo human moral patients, which I'll say more about um, in a couple of moments. Um, yes, they feel pleasure and pain often. Bonobos, yes. Bottlenose dolphins, yes. So all of these animals and mollusks we know now too, that's why I said it's a bit dated, um, at least certain mollusks may um, at least have some sort of sentient responses. Um, but what you see here going down on the, um, on, on my hand, the left side of the screen, is that there's these very higher order capacities that start to develop. Um, do, anim, do, the, do the humans feel anxiety? Do the animals feel anxiety? Are the humans able to recognize themselves? Are the animals able to recognize themselves? Do they recognize others? Do they recognize others as individuals that have a theory of mind? Do they have full biographical consciousness? This is the kind of measure um, that has been done, research is being done. This is how the similarity or the sameness response goes. We value something in ourselves and we think, do others, whether they're human or non-human, share those valuable capacities? And insofar as they do share those valuable capacities, they should be treated with moral concern. Now, in the case of the non-human rights project, which is this case that um, the most recent case is Happy the Elephant at the Bronx Zoo, this is the kind of strategy that's being adopted in the legal sphere to try to 
determine whether or not other animals, particularly in this case, an elephant, in earlier cases from the non-human rights project, chimpanzees, um, have the kinds of capacities that are morally relevant for personhood. And insofar as humans are persons, um, we would wanna go about it in the same way. Try to determine of the listed capacities for humans, this, this is from the philosopher's amicus brief, um, autonomy is extraordinarily important and autonomy and things like emotion and linguistic mastery, just the things I've been going through, sentience, capacity for conscious awareness, all of these kinds of things are the, are the capacities that matter to um, human persons. So we would think these are the kinds of capacities that should matter for Happy the Elephant and perhaps some other non-human app uh, non-human animals. So what they, they su suggest in this case is that there's evidence that elephants are autonomous, emotional, self-aware, sentient beings who have beliefs and desires, so they fulfill the requirement for personhood. This is the language directly from both the filings that the Non-Human Rights Project used, um, as well as the amicus brief. And the Non-Human Rights Project's goal is to, and this is a direct quote from them, change common law status for at least some non-human animals from mere things which lack the capacity to possess any legal rights to persons who possess the fundamental rights of bodily integrity and liberty. And these, these are ways of sort of identifying these individual capacities that animals might have that are also um, shared um, with humans that are considered persons. So basically what I, I'm trying to very quickly argue and I'm happy to discuss further, um, what I'm trying to quickly argue is that what we end up having here is a similar parallel strategy of extensionism. We're going to take individual capacities that we think are valuable in ourselves maybe extended out to our others that are like us in our communities, recognize there's still others that maybe aren't entirely like us, um, that we should still extend uh, our moral concern out to, um, and further still um, to some, at least some non-human animals. Now, I have some worries, and this is part of the discussion. I wanna highlight the worries that I have about the extensionist approach in both animal ethics and animal law. So one of the worries um, that I have it is, is that it overlooks what matters from the other's point of view. And that can be another human, but it can also be another animal. And here we have a picture of my chimpanzee friend, Shiva, um, who is um, in this image, um, pilo erect, her, her hair is up. Um, she's not happy with what's um, in, going on in her environment, and she's trying to look bigger than she does. She is an extremely uh, savvy, shall we say, uh, chimpanzee. And one of the things that matters to her that doesn't matter so much to one of her um, group mates, um, whose name is Ivy, is social harmony. Um, now, of course, if you know anything about chimpanzees, you, you know that um, they are fairly volatile and they often need to have conflict in order to reconcile. That's part of their affiliative behavior. But um, Shibu is never a big fan of drama. Ivy is a very big fan of drama. And, in, um, and these are two chimpanzees, roughly the same age in the same group with very different points of view. You might think, well, one of them is, is causing a ruckus. That's no good. But if if you look at Ivy's interest, it's good for her. It's not that great for Sheba. So when we have this extensionist approach, it's not possible to see that we're not that what really matters from the individual animal's point of view. We overlook what matters from their particular point of view. Also, as I've been discussing, human capacities remain at the center. And fundamentally, that perpetuates a certain tenet of human exceptionalism that I think importantly, we might not want um, always to center. 
Also, unique capacities get lost in this assimilation process. Um, the unique capacities of um, any number of animals that are quite different from us. Octopus have been on my mind a lot lately. So, I mean, it's really difficult to try to figure out how to extend our human-centered framework to include octopus who are not only so different from us, but one um, philosopher who studied um, octopus, Peter Godfrey Smith, have suggested that there might be parallel tracks or sort of two different tracks of evolution. They might not have even evolved the same way we did. They're very unique creatures um, and they may get lost um, and their capacities to for enjoyment may get lost in the assimilation if we're starting with human capacities that are morally valuable. And importantly for um, my discussion today, part of the problem with the extensionist approach is that it fails to examine the very injustices that are, that are embedded in this extensionist project. So what might the, these injustices look like? So what I'd like to do now is turn to talk about those um, injustices or the potential for these injustices. Now, if we look here, this is a, this is a interesting um, old kind of image that shows the particular kind of um, hierarchy, essentially, that puts man at the top, gorilla, orangutan, chimpanzee, gibbon, and ape men below. Um, apes in general are below them, semi-apes below them, primitive mammals below them, um, fish and others below them. And when we ground moral concern for others in the individual capacities that they share with those at the very top, um, or at the center, if you think about the concentric circles, it's easy to establish what we might call a moral hierarchy. And the history of these moral hierarchies are is fraught, the history is fraught with problems. Individual human beings typically have different interests than animals, and animals have different interests than other animals. And as I said a minute ago, even animals that are in the same sort of general category, like chimpanzees here, have interests that are different than others. But within this kind of individual framework, when we're taking man or human um, at the top and using the capacities or um, value, um, the value tools that the, the person at the top or the center has, what this amounts to saying is that some individuals like humans merit greater considerations, and this is what's really illustrative here, um, than other animals, but also that some animals are thought to be higher than other animals, and that is lower, they're lower. So humans might have more moral status, if you will. Chimpanzees might have more moral status than sloths. Sloths and rodents may have more moral status than mudfish or snakes. So you can see how um, these individual capacities lead to a certain kind of moral hierarchy. Here's another way of thinking about what's going on here. Although in this illustration of the Scala Natra, what you have is um, a white godlike bust figure of man at the top, and then happily a duck and a, a rabbit right below them. That's, I like that. And then the squid is a little bit lower. Then you get some plants, then you get some objects. There's some insects um, as well that are lower down. It's, it's a little bit of a skewed um, great chain of being. But, um, and basically the great chain of being um, is uh, something that's very common. It's um, often, even if it's not explicit, it's very much a part of human exceptionalism. And there have always been um, humans who espouse some version of the great chain of being to justify a kind of human exceptionalism. But we can't forget that these kinds of hierarchies um, have also served to exclude lesser humans, subhumans, 
and those who are sometimes sadly referred to as marginal humans. And if you remember back to the earlier slide um, where it says worst case moral patients, this is one of the issues that has led disability activists to be in many ways in opposition to animal rights and animal advocacy. Um, in part, not always, but in part because the, this strategy of sameness fails to recognize the value of their lives, even though their lives are quite different. Political responses to overcoming these hierarchies, um, although often framed as working to get higher on the ladder, that is working for, well, we don't need to exclude people of color. We don't need to exclude disabled people. We can include them in the higher sphere. Um, more often involves um, failing to see that the, that exclusion is central to these kinds of hierarchies that I've been des describing. And when people recognize that, the, confer the concern for social justice becomes much more clear. Those who protest violence against Black people, women, queer people, incarcerated people, indigenous people and their communities are concerned about the systematic barriers to constructing fulfilling lives. They're opposed to systems that prevent economic and social mobility. They identify various structures and institutions, for example, that depend on um, precluding them from making, um, having the opportunity to make meaningful um, advances. So for example, um, the very systems that are set up within the hierarchical structure don't allow for something like reparations for intergenerational setbacks um, for previous kinds of harm. And so I think importantly, even though there's a fairly regular way of seeing how we're talking about equality, we're talking about extending equality beyond the human to include other animals, that the structures that are part of the arguments, that was the first part of what I was talking about, this, those, the structure of argument of argumentation precludes um, a full inclusion of those who have historically been and the lower part of the social hierarchies and these moral hierarchies. And it's particularly problematic um, here, and I wanted to use this example. Um, it comes from uh, Claire Jean Kim's work in Dangerous Crossings. But here, um, it is a really uh, tricky form of um, racial, injustice that's built into, or if you will, naturalized by creating, this is what the ape man reference in um, that earlier slide refers to, this notion that there is a sense in which, and this is part of what Claire Kim says, historically conjoined, the logic of race and species taxonomy continue to sustain and energize one another in the joint project of producing the human and the subhuman and the not human and the less than human with all the entailments of moral considerability, physical vulnerability and grievability that follow. So the idea here is that once you start with this kind of hierarchical structure built in, it makes it extraordinarily challenging to move beyond the this, these structures. Um, I hope that was clear. We could, we could talk a little bit more about that. But the idea here, I think another way of thinking about this is that we um, have dehumanized and ultimately connected certain humans, people with disabilities, black people, um, others, indigenous people with animals as a way of putting them lower in the hierarchy, right? And so they become dehumanized in a, in a particular understanding of dehumanization 
as a result of these structures. And it's not possible to simply say, oh, well, we'll include you in the sphere of moral concern, or we'll recognize your capacities and bring you in and leave aside the historical taxonomies of power in that moment. The dehumanization is already present. And another way of putting the same point um, in a way that I hope might be clear, and this comes from Sil Coe's work in particular, drawing on um, decolonial thinkers like uh, Sylvia Winters. And the idea here is that the category of human isn't a biological category, it's a political category. And some human beings, some homo sapiens are left out of that category or have been left out of that category. When we naturalize the category of human, we are bringing along the historical degraded notion of the human. And there's a uh, precarity, if you will, about those individuals who are now included, but who could easily, given that the structures are in place, still be excluded in certain contexts. So what's the alternative? Well, one of the alternatives, I think, is to focus on the importance of relationality, to move away from this notion of individual capacities um, in arguing for the inclusion of various others, people, humans, who have been excluded from certain kinds of rights, excluded from certain kinds of resources, excluded from certain kinds of paths for meaningful lives, um, as well as non-humans. So if we were to focus instead of on the individual capacities and focus on relationality, we may end up um, in a better place going forward. It may actually turn out um, that we have more um, ability to really make substantive change in favor of social justice. So let me just say a little bit about what I mean, um, and then we'll have time to talk about all of this. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going so fast. Okay, why is it not going? Okay, the idea here is that we're in all kinds of relationships. Um, and this is, as I said, coming from some of the work that I've done in my book, Entangled Empathy. Um, and the idea here is that we're in these relationships with all sorts of others, near and far. Um, and one of the things that happens um, in the other frameworks that I was talking about, those justice frameworks, is that we tend to focus on individuals or individuals within the groups rather than on the relationships between individuals, both within their own sort of social identity group, but also between groups. Um, and I wanna also highlight that these relationships aren't just sort of the kind of relationship that you're in, say, with um, your friends or your classmates or you know, your, your other workers, um, but actually these are relationships that constitute who we are and we in turn constitute the relationship. So it's not a static kind of notion. It's a way we become who we are in these complicated webs of connection that we're in. And I, I, I also need to add here that part of what is happening when we recognize that we are in these relationships is to recognize not just that these are personal relationships, but also these are economic relationships, these are social, excuse me, and political relationships. These are relationships that also exist um, in very distinct ways. I like to think about um, palm oil as a great way of seeing the kind of complex that relationships we're in. Palm oil is a ubiquitous product. It's in almost every um, everything we quote unquote buy, including many, many vegan items. Um, and palm oil is produced in primarily in um, Indonesia and Borneo and Sumatra, but increasingly in parts of Africa where whole forests are, are burnt down um, humans that are in proximity to those forests end up getting asthma and other kinds of respiratory um, illnesses. The animals that lived in those forests are displaced, hunted, often killed. Um, and 
part and the orangutans that are being completely displaced in Indonesia are on the verge of extinction so that we can use palm oil in you know, vegan margarine and soaps and what have you. So these are relationships we're in. When we purchase something, we are harming the humans and the non-humans who have suffered from the deforestation and the havoc that their environments um, have undergone in order to produce palm oil. That's what I mean by relationship. I don't just mean the kind of personal relationships that we're familiar with. Part of why relationships are so important is that it often motivates us when we recognize that we're inherently in a whole variety of relations. It motivates us to reflect on the type and quality of those relationships that we're in. Nobody I know would endorse the view that it's okay to be in a bad relationship. I don't know anybody who think who would actually take the claim, I'm in a bad relationship and say, that's okay. What they probably say is it's not a bad relationship, right? They wouldn't say it's a bad relationship and that's good for me. I don't think, I don't think if they're reflecting ethically um, that anyone would endorse that notion. And so part of what happens when you think relationally is you start to have built-in motivations to change. Our relationship with animals, our relationship with food animals, our relationships with wild animals, our relationship with what um, Sue Donaldson and Will Kimmler could call liminal animals are not good relationships. And so if we're focused on relationships, we might be able to move people to start to think and act differently in their relationships. The reflection, I hope, will move us to attend to the relationships, make them more sustainable, make them better. And being able to change our relationships requires more than just personal reflection. So part of the thing that's happened um, over the years since I published Entangled Empathy is people have thought, well, isn't that just, you're just providing a tool for thinking differently about how to be in the world. Um, I think that's right. It is a tool for thinking how to be in the world, um, but it's also really important that we recognize that social resources are needed to support the kind of reflection that can lead to structural change. Um, and that's something that I think is absolutely essential if we're going to try to achieve social justice. And in my book coming out with Alice Crary, um, it'll be out in May. Um, we talk a little bit about how it is that we might be able to get to a place where social justice becomes primary in our thinking um, about the animal crisis that we face. Um, and so with that, I'm delighted to take your comments or questions. All righty, we have a couple. Um... So what inspired you to approach these social justice issues through an interconnected lens and what have been the challenges of doing so? That's a really interesting question. I, I, um, I came to this, uh, you know, I've been involved in animal advocacy for decades. And um, one of the things I did early on in my animal advocacy work before I went to graduate school um, was I was working with homeless women and their companion animals who were refusing to go to shelters because they couldn't bring their companion animals with them. And it started to become really clear to me that these issues are not so separate, that these are really interconnected issues um, and that women are going to experience sort of all kinds of hardships, but they're not gonna leave their cat or dog behind. Um, that, that we need to start thinking much more structurally um, and in ways that are more important. So that's one of the things. And then through working many over many years on issues that affect humans and animals, it's pretty clear that these structures um, need to be addressed and that the animal rights movement or the animal advocacy movement or the animal protection movement really can't just focus on minimizing suffering, especially given that so much suffering um, is happening now, more suffering is happening now, even though we've made so much progress. 
And in your book, Animal Ladies, you examine how characterizing animal advocacy as crazy can distract from the movement and has significant gendered consequences. How do you think advocates today can counteract those misconceptions? I think, well, so I think one of the things that's also really important in thinking about animal advocacy and social justice together is to recognize the way that certain kinds of, um, let's say gender uh, discrimination or gender stereotypes or gender um, divisions, binaries, differences um, become really central to address. Um, so part of the way to address it is to first show, wow, there's this problem with thinking about um, sort of women as overly concerned with nature or non-human animals. That's a, that's a stereotypical construction that needs to be unpacked. Um, and I think that binary thinking, like the hierarchical thinking, is part of the problem. We need to really recognize it when it's happening. And that's a way of diminishing um, women who are already usually, unfortunately, still not valued as much as certain others. Given your long standing work in the area of animal ethics, what would you say has been the most significant shift in your perspective and what inspired it? I think predominantly, um, this one of the major shifts in my perspective has come when I started to think about captivity. And um, interestingly, I started thinking about captivity because of a crisis that occurred with those chimp some of those chimpanzee friends that I was, um, I showed you slide a couple of pictures about. And those chimps were in real trouble. And um, that led me to recognize just how deeply complicated our captive sort of structures were. Then I started working in prisons and the combination of working in prisons and working with captive animals really helped me to sort of think about the ways in which these various structures um, need to be disentangled and we need to start to unpack some of the hierarchical discriminatory assumptions that underlie those particular frameworks. So we talked about that the non-human rights project has kind of started to focus their lawsuits on chimpanzees, elephants, and more intelligent species. What are your opinions on focusing specifically on those? Do you think that there could be a better way or a way to broaden um, those lawsuits? Yeah, so these are, this is a really uh, challenging question. And I think that I'm not criticizing, um, I'm really not criticizing the, the choice um, of animals. I'm not criticizing the, the legal methodology given the way in which um, our law is currently structured. What I'm trying to suggest is that in, in following along, trying to do this extensionist move, include these animals, include, we're supporting a system that is fundamentally hierarchical and um, unjust. And so, I mean, it does seem like being aware of that is an important part of the project. Um, it may turn out that I mean, it may turn out for, I mean, so there's lots of criticism. The one that I recently heard not too long ago within the last week is there's a whole nother way of getting happy the elephant out of the Bronx Zoo. And it's not by through the non-human rights projects strategy. The non-human rights project is trying to get a, a foothold so that some animal could be considered a person. That's what they're interested in. And that's an interesting project, but I'm trying to highlight it's a project that might not move us in the direction we ultimately want to move in. Um, and another criticism that I heard last week was that it might not even be the best strategy for happy the elephant. So, um, but I think this is part of the idea. It's not simply the non-human rights project. It's much of the animal advocacy movement. It's animal ethics in its traditional form. And the legal, some of the legal strategies that are being adopted are 
working in consort with a system that is fundamentally exclusionary um, and contains injustices. So my bringing this out is just to sort of raise awareness about the ways in which we might think more critically about um, what it is that we're doing. And in your book, Entangled Empathy, you discuss the concept as one that focuses on compassion for others. Do you have any recommendations on how to incorporate that concept into our daily lives, our interactions? Yeah, so, um, so let me just say a little bit about what Entangled Empathy is. Um, entangled Empathy is a, a type of moral perception that is a process. It involves recognizing the situation that another is in, um, recognizing the other as another, so not projecting your own views or attitudes onto that being, not your own strategies, your own hopes onto that being, but rather recognizing where they are, trying to understand them insofar as it's possible. It's never a complete understanding um, in their particularity. And trying to figure out what it is that would enhance their situation. Now, it, in some cases, it may be very clear and obvious because it may mean in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, this companion animal really is lonely when you leave your dog at home for eight hours every day. Figure out what would make the dog happy. Does the dog like to be the only dog? Or maybe you should get a second dog. You know, that sort of thing might be um, a, a way of engaging in entangled empathy in that kind of context. But it, can, it could be much, much bigger than that as well. Um, the idea would be something like, um, I am concerned about my students' inability to get funds to purchase textbooks um, because they come from a poor community. What can I do um, that would not just immediately take care of the, the books that they need, but also figuring out ways to create systems so that some students that come from um, less privileged backgrounds don't have to feel uncomfortable or anything like that, that they can't afford certain kinds of tools. So to, to recognize and be perceptive, not just, oh, they need a book, I'll buy them a book, but also, ooh, they might feel embarrassed about me buying the book. Maybe what I should do is make sure the library has more than just one copy on reserve, you know, those kinds of things. So it's not just immediately looking for a solution, um, but to, to really um, go through a process of recognizing what the other um, may be experiencing, not in just in terms of their immediate need, but also um, in terms of um, larger social and structural concerns. So we have a question that follows up on your answer regarding the non-human rights project's legal approach. Hmm. Pragmatically and ethically, would you recommend or advise against an animal cult? animal advocacy organization bringing a habeas case per se a battery cage chicken in new york given that judges are worried about the floodgates opening yeah i mean i think that in terms of this particular legal strategy um, there's a lot of advantages that can be made by following the legal strategy um, there's, I mean, there's a lot, there's so many details that it's hard to talk about it in the specifics. Um, but one of the things that I think it, so it is not a panacea, let's put it that way. Um, and it, it may work in one instance, but it may not, it may foreclose other possible liberatory actions in another instance. Um, there's also a tremendous amount of sort of the non-human rights project. I mean, unfortunately that it, because it is a specific group that has a specific goal, that is specific rhetoric, um, there's all sorts of reasons that you could think, oh, this could, this is, this is something um, that we could maybe criticize. Um, I think that um, ultimately one of the real concerns about this is that um, freedom, I mean, habeas, I mean, sort of, there's something quite peculiar about thinking that, um, that this is going to lead to freedom when we're going from, you know, one particular 
captive condition to another captive condition, even though it's a better captive condition. So there's a certain kind of peculiarity in the habeas notion. But I do want to say this, that I think that the idea that um, the law can recognize some individuals as persons means that there are going to be some individuals that are not persons. Like, so this is what I'm trying to get at, is that if we stay within that framework, and I think Manisha Decker's work on this, thinking about a whole different category, don't get stuck in the binary. And as an ecofeminist, um, and that's also some of the work that I do, these binaries have a very political motivation. And so just switching from one side of the binary to the other side of the binary does not erase that political exclusionary motivation. And that's really what I was um, talking about um, in my um, talk today. And one final related question to that, mm -hmm. uh, to what extent would you think that we should shy away from anthropo anthropocentric arguments? Again, lunchtime, clearly just words, if those are the ones that uh, resonate with judges? So this is, I think, a really hard question. And I, as a philosopher who does some legal work but has not ever argued in court, um, I feel a little bit out of, um, uh, out of school, out of turn, saying something about how, um, how you should argue before a particular judge. Um, I do think that, um, you know, there's this kind of, so in feminist scholarship, um, there's a notion that was really important, which was called strategic essentialism. And the idea here was that we know essentialism is problematic for all sorts of reasons. Essentialism here not being the Aristotelian sort of essentialism, but essentialism as an idea that somehow women are essentially nurturing or caring or something like that. So of course that's a that's a that's a stereotype. It's not true. It's a, it it's led to all sorts of private public splits. Um, but so we don't believe essentialism is is a, a good way to go. But there might be strategic instances in which it makes sense to employ the notion to make some progress. Again, going back to this notion of progress. And I think that's maybe something that can happen in the legal system. Strategic anthropocentric arguments, um, recognizing that these are strategic, not, not, um, not embracing them, but not embracing the idea that we're gonna assimilate, that we're assimilationists, but we might use strategic assimilationism in certain moments. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gruen. This has been an incredible presentation and we really appreciate all your time and taking a moment to answer some questions that came in. Um, this has been amazing and it's a really great way to see everything in a different view. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Sorry about my technological difficulties. No worries at all. Thank you so much. And if everybody else just continues on our next panel the fight for a sustainable food system will begin in the next few minutes so thank you so much <laughs>